And that's what the Lord was praying, that we would be one like He and the Father were one. This week I want to speak to you on the aspect, we'll look a little bit of, at Elijah's life. Elijah was a fascinating, powerful man of God. And we'll, we'll look as a backdrop of a little bit of his life, and then we'll discuss a couple of areas that kind of uh, tie in with that. Next week, on the subject of worldliness. Now, if, I, if you don't show up next week, I'll think you're worldly. So you, better, you might ought to come back next week and just sit through that. But next week, I, I really feel uh, the strongest that this is the, the, uh, what I need to say uh, last about this different area uh, that we're dealing with on the second wind of God. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. Let me give you just a little backdrop and before we take it up here in this particular part of the text. Elijah was kind of one of those guys that came from out of nowhere. Not too much known about him. Kind of, a, a, kind of like John the Baptist. He was known as Elijah the Tishbite. But we don't even know as much of the history uh, behind this man as we did the, the history of John the Baptist. We know more about John the Baptist's background, know more about his upbringing than we do about Elijah. All that we know is Elijah was an Old Testament general. And Elijah uh, had the heart of God in wanting to call the people of God to forsake their idols and come back to the Lord and worship the Lord Himself only. And they were torn between two opinions of serving the Lord or serving Baal. They really wanted to serve both. There's a lot of people like that today that they, they want to be on the fence or have their feet straddling the fence because they're afraid if they get too much into God, they're going to miss something good. But if they get too much into the world, they're, they're going to miss God. And uh, so there's a lot of people that are in that struggle today. But Elijah came on the scene and he preached to them and the, the fire of God fell in response to His Word. You have to realize that Elijah was a man so powerful that he said, stop raining, and for three and a half years, it quit raining. And then when, they, when Israel repented, immediately God began to say, I've got to bring healing to this land because they've repented, and I'm going to send water to them again, and I'm going to revive the crops, and I'm going to blow, I'm going to turn the blessing back on. But it was Elijah that, that called for it to shut off, and it was Elijah that called for it to be turned back on at the end of that three and a half year period. Powerful man of God. Powerful man of miracles. Astounding miracles would come through his life. Now notice something about this. Elijah was an Old Testament prophet. Elijah knew of Moses' law. And he, he was an Old Testament prophet. But then after the New Covenant... On the scene comes the apostles and, and the prophets of the early days. And they're moving in signs and wonders. And the Bible declares in the book of Haggai that God is going to create and make the latter house greater than the former house. I believe that God is going to do something in these last days. And I, be I believe we're crossing this threshold now in the Spirit. He's going to do things in these last days that are going to be more amazing than what He did in the foundation of the church. And in those uh, first century after the church, that God is going to begin to move in a dimension like we've never seen before. That's just interjected there. But you have to understand, here is a powerful man of God. On that mountain, he calls down fire. The people, Israel, the whole country turns back to God. They fall on their face and they say, the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And Elijah called for the execution of 850 false prophets. 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Ashtaroth. He called for a mass execution and they wiped them all out. This is a man with guts. Can you say amen? amen. This is a man that doesn't fear man. But I'm going to take you to a scene where a man that was fearless like this and stood alone feared a woman. How many of you know what that woman's name was? One woman, not 850 women. One woman. Who was she? Jezebel. Jezebel. I mean, you can say the word Jezebel and people go... It just, 
Even today, people talk about Jezebel that really don't even know the story about the original Jezebel. And it just always has a, a connotation of wickedness and witchcraft. And that's who this lady was. So you see this man of God that should have been, you know, being carried around on everybody's shoulders as a national hero. And it should have been all of that afterglow of this major move of God. He's a man that called uh, for it to rain again. I mean, he's a national hero, so to speak. And we'll pick it up in 1 Kings 19.3. Jezebel had said this. By your life, you're a dead man. I'll take you out. You have killed my prophets and you're going down. Before the day's out, I'm going to get you. And Elijah stood up and said, kill her too. In fact, let me have your sword. I'll kill her myself. Is that what he said? No. I mean, he was on a roll. I mean, he's had 850 prophets killed with no recourse, with no reaction, with, with no retaliation. They just stood there and got killed. He could have had some mighty people say, while you're at it, kill her too. But this major, mighty prophet of God, it says after she told him this, then he was afraid. Then he was afraid. Can you, can you grasp this? Can you wrap your brain around this? He was afraid of one woman. And she was the chief instigator of the worship of Baal in Ashtaroth. She was the one that called for this. She was the one that corrupted her husband and opened him up to idolatry. He was afraid and he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba of Judah over 80 miles out of Jezebel's realm. I want you to think, he's on foot now. He's on foot. That's like driving into the edge of Chicago and back. On foot. He runs for his life. He probably runs that far before he stops to see if anybody's following him. And then from that point, church, he goes another day into the wilderness. In other words, he still didn't feel like he was far enough from that lane. And so this catches us up to what's happened with all of this. It says in verse 4, But he himself, he, he dropped his servant off here, probably grabbed him up from across his shoulder and said, we got to get out of here. Drops him off 80 miles out of her realm, out of her queendom. And then goes another day. He probably didn't even want his servant to know where he was at. He's terrified. He comes to a juniper tree and then he asks, Lord, just let me die. It's enough for me. Just let me die. I mean, am I greater than my father's? I mean, just let me die. I, I, my ministry is over. I, you know, I didn't think it was going to go this way, but just let me go on ahead and die. Verse 5, and it says, As he lay asleep under the broom or juniper tree, behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. He looked, and behold, there was a cake baked on the coals and a bottle of water at his head. And he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. Understand that what he received the first time was a second helping, or a first helping of what he received the second time. But he, he ate and drank the first time. He was so exhausted. Can you imagine? In a sprint over 80 miles from where he left. Can you imagine how tired? How many? How Brother Rudy? How many of us could run from here to Chicago and back and not need to take a nap, brother? You know what I'm saying? We'd need a nap after that. So he's so tired, he eats this supernatural bread and he drinks this supernatural water and he passes back out again. And God says, get up, boy, and drink and eat some more. Why? Because you just think you've been on a journey. 
The journey that's still ahead of you is too great for you. And church, I want to testify to you today that the journey before us, the journey before the people of God is too great for us to run it in our own strength. There is going to come a place where human strength is no longer going to get us through. There's going to come a place in time where 15 minutes of prayer a week is not going to be enough to get us through. 15 minutes focused in the presence of God is not going to get us through. There's coming a time that we have got to learn what it is to drink and to eat and to receive it from God because the journey hereafter is going to be too great for us to do it in our own strength. I don't know why we even try to do it in our own strength. But you know what? We find ourselves doing that over and over. I'll tell you why. what I believe. is The flesh dies hard. The flesh wants to do it. After you're saved, the flesh wants to get religious and say, well, let me take it up from here. Paul said the Galatians, the Galatians were foolish because they tried to perfect in their flesh what God had started in their spirit. It's human nature. Even in Christians. I believe with all my heart that the Lord is sending a second wind to all of those who will arise and dare to eat. Not, not the wind of a past experience. Not the wind of, of some relation that you have had with Jesus or some touch that you've had in your past or some move of God that you've rode along with for a while. But I believe that something new is coming for all of those that will get up and eat and drink and take it in. I believe the Word of God is that bread. And I believe it's time, people of God, to pick that book up. You say, well, I've read it a number of times. Church, it's not a novel. It's not even a Christian novel. It's alive, it's powerful, and it will give you on a daily basis what you need for that day. God wants us to get into that Word. He wants us to meditate on that Word because He said in my Word is life. His Word is like no other Word. They said of Jesus Christ, nobody ever talked like Him. And it's time to get a fresh appetite for the Word of God. How many of you have ever been so tired you don't even feel like eating? Y'all tell I don't get that tired. There are things that, that make me feel like not eating this true. But one of the things that'll do that for sure is, is fatigue. Church, our culture, our generation, our day and time that we live in is not the way it was. How many of you can say it's not like it was 40, 50 years ago? I mean. Society is not like it was in those quiet times of family talks around the table and the old oil lamp and now it's time for family altar. I mean, we have to trip one another in the house just to get to say, I'm sorry. Just to talk to each other. It's busy. We're all going different ways. We're like a bunch of uh, golf balls that have been peeled. Just everywhere. It's a different society. It's the day we live in. But one thing is eternally true. We need time with Jesus. We need quality time with Jesus. We need quality time with each other. But more than anything, we need quality time eating the bread. And we need quality time drinking from that fountain of the Spirit of God. Because I'm going to tell you, you'll make the journey if you'll eat that bread and drink that drink. You will make the journey. You will not be one of those that others have to come along and pick it up and say, come on, we'll carry you. You will be one of those that are able to pick people up and put them on your back and say, let's go. I'm going I'm to carry you until you feel like running again. Wouldn't you rather be in that position? How many of you would rather be somebody strong enough to carry somebody than have to be carried by somebody This is a powerful verse in the Message Bible. It says this, Romans 8, 11. It stands to reason, doesn't it, that if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, how many of you can say, I'm glad He moved into my life? That's right. He'll do the same thing. Watch this. He will do the same thing in you that He did in Jesus. Bringing you alive to Himself. That's what God did when He raised Jesus from the dead. 
<laughs> he said, come away, my beloved. Come back. He will do the same thing in us that He did for Jesus. He will resurrect our weary, fatigued, wore out, burn out being with His life. Listen to what it goes on to say. When God lives and breathes in you, and He does as surely as He did in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life. How many of you are glad to be delivered from a dead life? You know, there's a lot of people living the dead life. I'd rather live the live life, wouldn't you? Look around at somebody and say, live the live life. Say it ten times fast. I don't have time for this. With, with His Spirit living in you, your body will be as alive as Christ. The Scripture says, if that same... I said the Scripture, the King James Version of the Scripture says, if that same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, He will quicken or make alive your mortal body by His Spirit that lives in you. It's the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Folks, that is a powerful Spirit. Church, it's too powerful of a Spirit to allow depression to devour us. It's too powerful of a Spirit to allow poverty, the Spirit of poverty to keep us from doing everything that God has called us to do. It's too powerful of a spirit to allow old age to slow us down because it's the same spirit that what raised Christ from the dead. Listen, if He quickened a body that was that dead, He can quicken an old body. He can put life in your old body until you get a new body. Hallelujah. He can do that for you and He wants to do that for you and if you accept anything less than that, you're being ripped off. Now, I'm not saying when you're 90 years old that you're going to be able to do like backflips and, and do limbo and skating parties or anything like that. I'm not suggesting that or making you feel condemned or you're not as spiritual as some people. I'm not saying it's going to be like that. But He will keep you going. He will keep you strong in your spirit. And if you're strong in your spirit, it's going to bless your physical body. It's just going to. Now when you're 70, you may never run at the pace you ran when you were 30, but you'll still have something different about you on the inside of you, giving you hope, giving you life. On the morning of the resurrection, some of the lovers of Jesus, watch this, came to put spices on Him. The Bible says they did that. Oh, how sweet. But what it was, church, was a sign that they did not believe Jesus was good enough to keep His Word. He told them, I'm going to die. But don't worry, I'll be back. But they didn't believe Him. He said, on the third day, I'll be back. They didn't believe Him because they were coming to anoint a dead body. Church, I'm afraid that those of us in America sometimes are just like them. He's told us He's going to move. He's going to change us. He is going to work in us. If that same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, and He that has begun a good work in you, will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we don't believe in this. I mean, we say we do. They said they did, but they were still coming with something to make a dead body smell good. How many of you know you don't put burial spices on a resurrected body? As a matter of fact, they found that there was no body there to even put that stuff on. We need an expectation in this hour, church. It's time to believe Jesus again. It's time to expect miracles in people's lives. It's time to pray and actually believe what you're praying that God's going to heal that person. God's going to change this situation. It's time to believe it. And all the evangelists still running the earth. Preaching the gospel. I see him every now and then on some satellite channel. Ernest Angel, he, he some of those guys just strike you as just weird. I mean, Catherine Kuma was powerful, but she was just strange. She looked like a ghost. She wore these flowing gowns and she talked like this. Talked like Bella Lugosi's sister, you know. And God's going to heal you. Ernest Angel would pray over you and say, Be healed in Jesus' name. And masses have been healed in and through His ministry. But the first seven people, when God called Him to a miracle ministry, the first seven people He went to the hospital and prayed for died. And He could have said, you know what? This is not my ministry. People start looking at you like, oh no, don't pray for me. I'm going to be alright. <laughs> One of the first times I was bold enough to pray for somebody. I wanted to pray for my, my little sister-in-law, Tammy's little sister. 
She was sick. And I was like full of faith and power. Probably full of paste and flour, but I wanted to pray for her. He said, Nancy, Jesus can heal you. I mean, I'm trying to get Nancy to come to the Lord. Jesus can heal you. Let me pray for you. Okay, I'll try anything. I lay hands on her. Ah, it's almost like, voila! I said, how do you feel now? She says, well, I felt sick before, but now I have a split in the headache. <laughs> you are going to meet things that will contradict what you believe, but you've got to keep butting heads with it. The Bible says the Word of God is like a hammer. I know we've got some powerful men in this church, but I bet you there ain't none of you that can drive a single penny nail with a normal, not a single penny, a 16 penny nail with a, a normal 16 ounce hammer and one poof. Now you might be that powerful, but a hammer is a device you use like this. Bang, 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 bang. It's not bang. Well, I pray, bang, and nothing happened. The nail fell over. I mashed my fingernail. A hammer is a repetitious thing. Jeremiah said God's Word is like a hammer. God's Word is like a hammer. You don't just say, okay, poof, you're better. Abracadabra, you're better. No. It's like a hammer. Church, you have to keep going. Even when it doesn't look like it's happening, press until you press through. Pray until you pray through. Whatever's coming to me now is messing with my message. But i got to tell you this. My message is going this way, but I'm going to go that way. There were some people that lost a daughter. She died. There was an epidemic of things going on. And she died and they were ready to carry her off. They were going to bury her before the sun went down. The people that do that. And they said, oh, no, no, no. What are you going to do with her? She's dead. Let us have her. Oh, no, no. She, she, she just asleep. No, no, she's dead. She don't have a heartbeat. Uh, she, you know, they held a mirror under her nose. The lights were off. The power, they came and took the uh, they came and took the meter. I mean, she was dead. Fourteen hours later, look at somebody and say, fourteen hours later. Fourteen hours later, she wasn't dead no more. She got up, hallelujah. Because mom and dad and brothers and sisters said, No! Death, leave her alone. And they prayed, and they prayed for an hour and nothing happened. They prayed for two hours and nothing happened. But they decided they weren't going to stop praying until heaven said she's done. And since God didn't give them that indication, they prayed until they prayed that girl back to life. You want to see that again? Listen, God has not gotten old and unable to do such things. He's a fountain of life. He's stronger than you and I can even grasp and believe He is. All He needs is somebody that will say, I believe it even if I don't see it. I'm going to believe it until I see it. You can discern what God's will is and you keep going with that discerning even when the circumstances say, no, I don't think so. It's over. You butt heads with it until you get an answer from heaven. The breath of resuscitation. Some of us need that sometimes. You ever had the wind knocked out of you? That can happen to you spiritually. That can happen to you spiritually. If I already went 20 minutes, probably a mile. Phew. I may have to put this in, refer this to another message here, but let me give you this. Let me just give you this. If I just give you this, will you come back? <laughs> I want to give you more, but I don't really want you to come back. If you don't promise me you're coming back, I'm going to give it all to you. I'm going to do the other message too. <laughs> you know? Proverbs 13 and 12. The Scripture means so much to me. Hope deferred. Hope prolonged. Makes your heart sick. I mean, God... How many of you has God ever made you a promise? I mean, you knew it was a personal promise. Maybe it was a prophecy or something the Lord spoke to you in prayer. You knew it was the voice of God. How many of you ever had that happen? Showed you something He's going to do. How many of you, probably the same amount of hands, could say, it, maybe it even hasn't come to pass yet, or maybe it took a while. But God will make, make good on His promise. 
God is the one that puts hope in our heart to start with. And then He lets stuff come to challenge what He's told you is going to be. He lets stuff come to contradict His promises. Hope prolonged makes your heart sick. It's like being exhausted or so grieved it paralyzes you. But a longing, the NIV says, but what it really means, but when a dream comes true, it's like a tree of life. You see, church, God is a God that gives, puts a dream in your soul. God is a God that allows the things to come to make the dream impossible. And then He is the God that supernaturally fulfills the dream He gave. You see, it's not an evidence when it doesn't happen right away or even after some years that He's not going to do it. Because one thing I know about God, He can't lie. If He's told you something, you can take it to the bank. You better put it in heaven's bank because it's not that safe here on earth. But if He's told you something, you can depend on it. He's going to come through. It's time to walk in a sense of expectation again. In a sense of expecting God to fulfill the promises He's made. How many of you know there is a, something coming on us probably quicker than most of us are looking forward to called winter? How many of you love shoveling snow? Sister, we're going to pray for you again. How many times are we going to have to pray for you again? How many of you love driving with people that don't know how to drive on dry pavement, much less on icy pavement? 